Tell me, can you find a subliminal sexual message in this ad? No, I thought not. Everybody loves it, babe. You're crazy. Wacko. Sick. Prolific. Who was that? My mother. He knew yuppie yo-yo. Do you trust a guy who talks dirty to his mother? Sort of an Oedipus type. Mm. I'd find that a bit concerning. Uncomfortable. Very much. Especially if I was there. That'd be really weird. Yeah. Depends who the mother was. That's true. Moving on. Swiftly. Quickly. <laughs> how are you doing? I am not too bad, Jerry. How are you? Dreadful. What's wrong with you today? Hung over to F. Really? Yeah. Inappropriate behaviour. It is inappropriate. Uh, it's a bad one. I am not going to drink for at least three days now. It's probably wise. Yeah, definitely. No, I feel a bit rough, so this is going to be a short one. I had a, a dry January and February, but it was entirely by accident. I just didn't have anything to drink. Well, funny you should say that. The reason I ended up drinking last night, which is a school night and I shouldn't have, was my father always takes off. He's not an alcoholic or anything, but he always has a dry uh, February. Right. And November. The two shortest months of the year, coincidentally enough. <laughs> <laughs> but he always takes him off, gives himself a, a dry month. And um, being the, the first of the following month, Take advantage. he was choking himself for a, a, a pint and I joined him. It was only meant to be a couple of pints. Right. Never ends up that way. Well. Football on the TV. That's right, last night there was. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's what happens when you get a dry month, you get a very wet one after it. <laughs> this week's episode... Yes, it's one of the longest titles we've had. It certainly was. Terrible for note-taking. Yes, and also for graphic creation for the... File naming conventions. All these things. Copy and paste. That's it. But fun. Yes, I quite enjoyed the episode. Some classic sledge. There were some moments, weren't there? I think we've got one at least in the clips, which is hilarious. Yeah. We can get to that. Anything you want to say before we start? I suppose I could put in my usual um, plea to folk to rate and review and subscribe to us on iTunes because it helps other people find the show and speak to us on social media. We're at Sledgecast on Facebook and on Twitter. And you can find out about each episode or chat about each episode over at sledgehammerpodcast.com. Also, possibly a last call for any questions ahead of our final episode. Okay. Got a summary? I do. Crack on. In Suppose They Gave a War and Sledge Came, an executive paintballing excursion ends in murder when Edmund Bryce, the much reviled head of Vectrocon, is shot dead. Sledge and Dory are confounded by a series of plausible alibis presented by their chief suspects before catching a break when Hammer is invited to the next paintball outing. As anticipated, he winds up face to face with the murderer, setting up a dramatic finale. But can he make the arrest, or will his testosterone get in the way? Why would his Ferrari get in the way? <laughs> <laughs> we begin in the woods, first time I think. First time we've begun in the woods? Yeah. Possibly, yeah. We see a number of men playing paintball. Yes. They're running around the woods trying to shoot each other with paint pellets. Have you played paintball before? I haven't, but I'm led to believe it can be more painful than you would imagine. We went with the work one time a number of years ago. For us, more than five years ago, then. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was uh, yeah painful, especially when folk think they're clever and they come up and shoot you from like very close. There was one chap, won't name him, maybe you can guess, who didn't abide by the rules and even when dead would appear from nowhere, shoot you several times. I can I can only imagine yeah. someone who likes to cut corners, perhaps. Perhaps. Anyhow, these chaps are in the woods shooting each other, playing paintball, corporate event, executive paintball. They shoot each other until. And Ed Bryce is confronted by a masked killer. Yeah, just before that happens, is he allowed to use an unlimited player as a shield or is he cheating at this game? Don't know what the rules are. It does seem a little bit unethical. Mm. So he uses this body of someone who is not actually dead, but limp, <laughs> to shield himself from two of his colleagues before taking them down and making a big speech about how he's much smarter than they are. And then he's shot in the back. Yes. He gets his comeuppance. He does, because he is furious at being shot in the back and turns around to make a, a show of nobody shoots Edmund Bryce in the back, but he's then shot again. But this time, for real. Yeah, a bullet. 
Not good. No, and I think he, he tries to make a, a dying speech, but <laughs> cut off slightly early. And we head over to Trunk's office. He briefs Sledge and Dory on what has happened. The deceased was one Edmund Bryce, 49. He was the president of Vectrocon. It's a company that makes... Vectros? Hammer. Cons? Put that down. Leading computer company in the country. Thank you, Doro. Bryce was a hard-nosed competitor. He liked to play war games with his top executives. They donned military uniforms and stalk each other with guns that shot paint pellets. Put that down. Oh, white-collar weirdos. Why play war when you can join the police force and kill for fun and profit and use real bullets? Don't put that down. Well, according to the articles I've read, war games help sharpen business skills. Strategy, tactics, risk-taking. Risk-taking. Hey, I risk my life every night of my life, rain or shine. That's risk-taking. Being a cop. No, eating those pork nuggets. You don't know what's in those things. And Hammer, that's... you are risking your life if you don't get cracking on this case right now. Now move it! Is this really your mother? Put that down. What? I said put that down! Well, the kid is ugly. Put that down and get out of here! Get on that case right now, you idiot! I think Sledge genuinely loves to win Trunk Up. Yeah. I think that might be one of my favourite scenes in the entire run. Yeah, it's, it's one of those sort of types of scene. We've seen it a lot of times. Trunk's explaining the case and Hammer's acting the fool, but it was a particularly effective one. They play off each other fantastically well. I think they've got their timing down at this point. Definitely. Crime scene. Sledge and Dory arrive with a now familiar bump. Yeah, that's getting a bit silly now. They find Majoy waiting for them. And he points out some tyre tracks, which Dory impressively is able to ID. Well, we later find out she's wrong. But yes, she's analysing it. It seems impressive. Make, model, condition. Yes, a particular flaw in the, the vehicle. <laughs> Hammer tries to act like that analysis was obvious and a two-year-old could have figured out and Majoy <laughs> turns that back on him. How? He says that um, maybe the two-year-old should be the chief of detectives. <laughs> and, and Hammer says, enough of your homespun humour. <laughs> the only other clue is a monogrammed boot imprint with an S in the sole that Daly is looking into. Yeah, she's going to try to cast it, but she has a bit of a problem. What is that? Sledge drinks her plaster. <laughs> and rather than admit it, he storms off into the bushes. He tries to deflect attention, pretending to look for clues in these bushes. <laughs> he's warned by Dory that the, the bushes are full of poison ivy, but he declares that he's immune and um, sets the stage for an amusing bit of physical comedy in the future. I think we can immediately predict what's going to happen. Absolutely. Over to Vectracon HQ. Yes. Yeah, so Sinister. Just, yeah, he's in a bad way with the itching and the pain. <laughs> they introduce themselves to Tina, who was Bryce's private secretary, and ask to see Bryce's former business partners. Yes, they have to go up to the 27th floor. 28th. Well, I think they're a bit inconsistent on this. Okay. We might bring this up. Uh, yeah, 28th is what I originally noted. So we'll go with that for now. Um, but they have to go up the stairs. To see? Swenson. Arvin Swenson. Um, Why do they need to take the stairs? Bryce has deactivated the lifts because using the stairs is better for you. The elevators? Instead of lifts. Yeah. This is an American show, Ian. We will use American terminology. Remember we upset that one guy in the Columbo podcast and gave us a bad review? Yeah, he did. Our only, <laughs> our only ever less than five star review. It was a three star as well for using American term. He said he liked the show, loved the show, yes. but didn't like it that we used uh, things like uh, trash instead of Bin, bins. And trunk instead yeah. of boot. Anyway, Captain Boot shows up. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Very good. He doesn't. He doesn't. No. It's um, the secretary who leads the way. Up the stairs. Yeah, to see Swenson. With Sledge trying to hide this itching and scratching that's getting worse. Yes. I think you might want to bathe in calamine lotion at this stage. Dory is fit enough to get up the 28 floors with no problem. Yes, but Sledge is struggling. Yeah, when he eventually arrives there, he's he's barely alive. He's shouting, help me. <laughs> Sweat's pouring out of him. <laughs> at least his vertigo's cured. In Swenson's office. And we see Swenson himself, who has the most incredibly hairy arms I've ever seen in my life. It was unusual. They ask him who would want to see Bryce dead, 
and he says about 120 million Japanese. Yeah, apparently their particular product has been harming the overseas import market. Yes. He then admits that everyone hated Bryce, including himself, for being denied promotion. Dory and Swenson also notice at this point that Sledge is itching. <laughs> and they're, I think, a bit disgusted by it. You would be. At this point, what does Swenson do? He puts his feet up on the desk. Mm -hmm. And they notice it's got a big S. It's not really... Is that what you'd call a monogram? It just looks like it's been stuck on the end of his shoe. Yes, but is a monogram not anything that is personalised in suppose, that sense? Yeah, I I'm, not sure if, I'm not sure if it's a specific technique as opposed to... Okay. Yeah, yeah, so he's got big S's on both feet. Naturally, Sledge thinks the case is closed for this reject from the planet of the apes. He, though, explains he's just received the boots now and he's not worn them before. And he produces a receipt to prove this. Dory seems convinced by that. Hammer's not. He says he doesn't buy the receipt and shave those arms. <laughs> so they head out to the hall where they bump into Tina. And she tells them that Mr. Nakamishi is on the 10th floor. This is another business partner. And Sledge tries to do some basic math, not maths, uh, while scratching away. Yes, he's trying to work out the difference between the floor they're on and the 10th floor. He makes it 19 and Dory makes it 17. But if they're on the 28th floor, they're both wrong. But if you've got to get down, how many floors do you have? So you go 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10. 18. Okay. <laughs> so that's why I thought maybe they're on the 27th floor and that would make Dory correct. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6 and 5 make 11. Something like that, yes. <laughs> This is terrible, terrible podcasting for a start. Us with our fingers out. Counting. Yeah. But I showed I can count from 28 to 10. Yeah, I'm glad we didn't have to count higher than 20. Who knows what we'd have to have produced. <sighs> that would be awkward. 21 and a half. Yeah. Anyway, where are we? Um, the secretary advises that she wasn't part of this paintballing excursion at this stage. No, she wasn't allowed to play because Bryce thought women should stay at home and bake pound cakes. Not war. <laughs> Make cake, not... Have you ever had a pound cake before? I don't even know what a pound cake is. That's a basic sponge. It must be. They've mentioned it already in Sledgehammer. Right. I did come across the phrase not that long. I'm sure it was a New York Times recipe for pound cakes. I wonder if it's an American staple. Which is like the standard cake that gets produced. Like we would do a, a basic sponge. Maybe it's either the same or the equivalent. A pound of something. Pound yeah. of flour. Yeah, it's a pound of everything maybe. If it's yeah. like one, one, one. I don't know what the ratios are. Bake Off. You watched Bake Off as well? I watched one series of Bake Off. You told me you, you knew who the winner was. That one series. Well, you watched a series of Bake Off. How many episodes yeah, were they're doing sort of how many, French things. They don't start how, at the beginning. Excuse me, how many episodes were in a season? Oh, I don't know. I watched the last ten, maybe. You, 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 you're more than ten. You've watched ten episodes about baking and you don't know... Yeah, they don't teach how you how to bake on how, it. Of course they do. They, they, must, they must show you how to bake a basic cake. Oh, you, you put some no, no flour and sugar and egg. Fancy Give stuff. it a stir. It's all stupid fancy stuff. I don't know. Right, back to Sledgehammer. Yes, to get to Nakamishi's office. Before that, okay. Dory suggests that perhaps Bryce was a f didn't let her compete because he was afraid that a woman would beat him. And Sledge reacts as expected. Yeah, he's not impressed by that suggestion no. at all. Nakamishi's office. He's doing a long calculation. Why? He wants to know what it's going to cost him to get braces for his daughter. <laughs> Sledge and then this is brilliant. Did you notice this? He's really very itchy and his back's itching. So he picks up a toy reptile. Yes, like a Godzilla. Yeah. And uses the what's the things in the back called? It's not fins. Spines. Spine. Is that is that spines? Yeah, I would say that. Or spine plates, maybe, but yeah, okay. I would say spines. The jaggy things in the back of a dinosaur. Yeah. He uses that to scratch his back. Yeah. I mean giving the Japanese guy a toy Godzilla is a little bit cliche. Yeah. Just suggesting that, maybe. Anyway. Yeah, maybe, but you know what? James Cook, who you've met. Yes. The BBC reporter, who yeah. used to be based in Scotland, we've interviewed, uh, but is now based uh, stateside. LA, yep. Yeah. He was presenting at the Oscars. Was he? Yes. I was doing interviews. Oh, right, for the BBC. He wasn't presenting Sorry, sorry, no, he wasn't presenting. He was presenting a, a show right. outside, interviewing the usual sort of stuff. Okay. And of course, we're talking about cliche here. Yeah. He had to turn up in a kilt. Just because you're from Scotland doesn't mean to say you have to wear a kilt on any for every formal occasion. I would. See, I wouldn't. I prefer to wear a kilt to wear a suit. 
Why? I've told this this cliche before. The, the Dutch don't go just because it's associated national dress. The Dutch don't go everywhere in clogs. The Japanese don't go everywhere wearing the kimonos. No, but I, I yeah. think it's a perfectly acceptable alternative to a suit. Yeah, but it's, it's cliched. I wouldn't say it's cliche. Of course, it is a cliche. How's a, how can a kilt a Scottish, a, Scot- a suit's not? A Scottish man wearing a kilt on occasion is a cliche. An English man in a suit a cliche? No, because a, a suit's not an English... Everyone wears suits. Okay. An English man wearing a bowler hat would be, but they don't, because it's just a, a thing that they used to wear. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> Nakamishi admits that he wanted Bryce dead because he want, Bryce had asked him to cheat on the books and he was refusing to do that. And now that Bryce is dead, he can regain or retain his professional integrity. However, Sledge's finger of suspicion now points at Nakamishi when they discover that he drives the car, apparently ID'd by Dory at the crime scene. Yes, he's got a model of it on his desk. And Hammer thinks it's just a toy, but Nakamishi confirms it is a scale model of his own car. However, he insists that his car has been in the repair shop for several days and he points a finger himself at Monroe on level 38. Yeah, in the middle of this conversation, and it might just be another cliche, it did appear to me that Nakamishi did a sumo move on Sledge. Yeah, he certainly jumped at him. Hmm. Anyway, yes, Hammer's, uh, sorry, Hammer is outraged at the thought of going to the 38th floor. <laughs> and as they leave, Sledge asks about a diagram model on the wall, which apparently has taken an awful long time for Nakamishi to produce. It's a, some sort of business It's uh, the workflow. business model for the whole of the North American continent. It's taken him seven years. If, it, if that had taken him seven years, he has been working very slow. He's done it in a very unfortunate way. Yeah, why? Because Sledge shuts the door and it all falls down. Mm. In fairness, this isn't Sledge's fault. No, it's not at all Sledge's fault. A firmly shut door should not destroy your seven year project. Yeah, and that cannot be the first time the door's been shut firmly. No. Plus, if I was designing that, you design it on paper first, then you build it. Yeah, and you would have photos and stuff like that as well. Of course you would. It'd be easy yeah. to put back together. This and guy's a fool. It outrages him. Yeah, nonsense. He storms out the office and chucks the model car. That sledge who then falls down all the way from the 10th floor to the ground floor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you see the stuntman in the sledge Yeah, work? of course. <laughs> Dory's upset. She's worried Hammer might have hurt himself. But he says no. No. Yeah, my favourite line of the episode. He says, Doro, I don't itch anymore. (laughs) Why is that? Because I'm dead. (laughs) And over to the precinct where Sledge summarises where they are in the case. Just doesn't track, Doro. Two suspects, each with a motive. They leave clues nailing them to the murder scene. But their ridiculous alibis check out. I haven't heard anything this confusing since Oliver North started testifying. Bingo, Inspector. Bingo, Major. I don't have time for police fundraisers. Hey, Earth Call and Hammer. I found the murder weapon. It's registered to Derward Monroe. Monroe. It's a lock. Monroe is the murderer. Now, where did you find this, Major? I found it buried under a hill of fire ants. Oh! That's why I put it in plastic. Yeah. Sledge doesn't need a lot of convincing, does he? In terms of who the guilty party may be in cases. Yeah, the slightest bit of suspicion and he's just right there. Did you see how quickly he reacted to the possibility of more itching? Very quickly indeed. That was his, his draw arm. That was it. That was in full effect. They head over to Vectrocon. There's a weird scene. <laughs> well, <laughs> we hear Sledge and Dory climb the stairs. We don't see them, so we hear them struggle up. Or certainly one of them is struggling. This time it appears to be Dory. Yeah. We soon discover why. Well, she's got Sledge on her back. But even before they go up the stairs, the secretary, you see her running on the spot and someone off camera just chucks a bucket of water over her. Yeah. And she says, thanks. This is <laughs> completely <laughs> random. It doesn't affect the story. It's no. Just... I think it's just showing that um, she's such a fitness fanatic. She's being cooled down here. She's always requiring... Someone's just wandering by and chucking water at her. Yeah. Dory dumps Sledge down on the 28th floor. Yes, and he says that he needs his strength for deductive reasoning. (laughs) But she wants him to carry her to the 38, but there's no need. Why not? Because Monroe has showed up and gone to Swenson's office. 
So we enter there to find Monroe on the phone <laughs> beside a, a sexualized ad. That's what we heard at the top of the podcast. Yeah, it's a bikini model with a computer and it says, I'm hot for Vectrocon. <laughs> and he's saying that his mother's crazy for thinking there's a hidden sexual message in this. Dory immediately arrests him for the murder, but he seems quite unconcerned until Sledge grabs him and he claims that he reported his gun missing months ago. It does seem like the kind of thing a killer would do, report your gun stolen before you use it to kill somebody. That must have happened in some real life crimes as well. Yeah, um, it's a chancy one. You're immediately pointing suspicion at yourself. So my thinking, this is very Columbo-esque, this discussion brings me back. But I'm thinking that you'd have to be very confident, very arrogant, because most people, if I'm killing you, for example, I'm not that you've thought about this. No, not that I thought about it at all. <laughs> Several times. Whilst editing the show. <laughs> um, but if I was going to kill you, for example, I would try to get, give myself an alibi and not be under any suspicion whatsoever. So to deliberately use my gun in order to sort of pr uh, provide a double bluff, yeah, it takes a certain type of person to do that. Yeah, it's bold. Very bold. As brass. Yes. That's what he's done in any case. Well, that's what... That's what he says. So Dory calls Daly, who confirms the story, while Sledge improves the ad. How? He draws clothes and a gun on the woman. <laughs> and when they leave the office, Dory thanks him for criticising the ad. And he says there was no need for the gratuitous inclusion of a computer. Now, that's weird. She shakes her head, but he's covered up the woman, so... Yeah, I think he's joking. I think, yeah, he's genuinely taunting her here. Before they leave the office... Uh, they have to let him go, but Sledge tells him that if he sees another disgusting ad like that, he'll be back with Jerry Falwell. Is that like the Mary White House of America? No, he was an uh, an extremist religious figure, uh, an evangelist, um, disgusting character, to right. be honest. Uh, some of his views are abhorrent. If you have time, Christopher Hitchens on numerous occasions has ripped him the proverbial new one. Precinct. Yes, uh, Hammer and Tory. Are looking at a model of the paintball course. Yeah, the battlefield. Uh, a bit like we saw it on oh, no. Grand Deceptions. The icebreaker, I was oh, going to say. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's led to a plan of this battlefield with the toy soldiers laid out in order to try and solve the murder. And we find out he has been invited by an anonymous person to the next war game. Yeah. Did you get the impression watching this that paintballing wasn't yet as popular as it has come to be? It seemed like it was a new concept to these guys. Like, whereas now I think almost everyone would know immediately what paintballing was. Trunk had to explain to them and Dory had to say why is it good for business and all this sort of stuff at the opening. No, but I don't think Dory explained to Sledge why... Sledge just couldn't see by the fact that people were being violent. So you think it's just Sledge? I think it's just Sledge, yeah. Okay. I like this bit here. Dory suggests to Trunk that the three men work together to make the killing and Trunk is outraged at this idea. Why? He would expect that sort of sick, twisted thinking from Hammer, not her. And that's kind of continual little thing that we've seen. Mm -hmm. Folk have been suggesting, you know, Dory's getting a bit, or certainly you have on the podcast, been suggesting that Dory does a little bit Hammerish things that she's certainly getting rubbed, he's rubbing off on her. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so to speak. In a manner of speaking. As they're talking, we see Sledge reenact the battle by donning different hats and moving around the the battlefield, the mock-up battlefield, before he sets off a remote control mortar. <laughs> it literally blows up the entire thing. <laughs> He's This is him getting ready to meet this killer. And Trunk silently wishes luck to the killer. Yes. Dory asks Hammer what will happen if he is killed. And he very generously says she can have his parking spot. Nice touch. He's, he's shown affection to Dory more than once. On to the battlefield for real. Oh, Hammer does his rubbish parking job again. Yep, and he is met by all three suspects. None of whom take credit for inviting him. He takes a gun and is eager to start. Yeah, well he refuses the gun in the uniform they offer him. He takes a different gun and stays in his suit. And then starts talking to his gun. Yeah, he says he loves the smell of paint gun in the morning. <laughs> And before this day is over, he promises you'll make a red stain, but not with paint. It's a bit obvious and blunt. Yeah, talking to his gun. Yeah. Sledge then proceeds to, quite quickly, take out all of the suspects. Yeah, by taking his clothes off and making them think he's standing there. <laughs> so 
he ends up in his underpants and socks. Yes, at this point I figured out who the killer was. Did you? Yeah, I've got it written in my notes. A regular little Columbo we have. <laughs> anyway, his shirt is shot by the killer, but he's not wearing it. He jumps down from behind her, as you see, in his pants and tie. He's, he's obviously kept the tie on, or put the tie back on after removing his shirt. Yeah, and he is able to ID the killer. Who is it? It's Tina. Yes. She explains her motive. You can stop with a hide and seek, Tina. How'd you figure it out, Inspector? It was obvious. The men had everything to lose by killing Bryce. Only a woman would kill a man with nothing to gain. You doubled Swenson's boots, you stole Monroe's gun, and you put four by four tires on your own car to make it look like Nakamichi and the others were involved. But I saw through it. Incredible! How'd you figure it out? Well, at first I tried to blame it on welfare cheaters, but when that didn't work out, it seemed like the logical way to go. Oh, come on, give it up, Tina. There's no way you can win. I'm a man, and you're nothing but a soft, silly woman. That's exactly what Bryce said when he dumped me. Started having affairs with all those other cheap floozies. So you killed him because you wanted to be the only cheap floozy he had. Okay, okay, the only expensive floozy. No, I killed him because when I complained about the others, he said he was going to fire me. Sounds like my kind of guy. At this point, Sledge disarms her. And Dorian Trunk arrive. Yeah, a bit late, he's already saved the day, but Sledge thinks there was no need for Dory to show up to help him anyway because Tina was out of bullets. Apparently. To that. prove it, he shoots at Trunk's car. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's clearly at least one bullet left. <laughs> And he gets a bit of an earful. He does. We're on the battleground for the epilogue this week. And a trouserless sledge bemoans how things ended. Yeah, he never got to use his grenade. <laughs> so he, he resists Trunk's suggestion. That Orders. He, that he does not use the grenade. And chucks it over his shoulder without even looking. And it detonates. He says, it's who I am, it's what I do. And we get the best final line of an episode so far in the entire series. Which is? Put some pants on. <laughs> I think we should use that as our new, our new closing line on the podcast. Put some pants on? Yeah. Okay. It might mean something different to our British audience. And that's us. Yeah. Like we said at the top, it's a good episode. Yeah. Very fun. A silly episode. Oh, definitely silly, but fun. Uh, got any trivia for us? I do. Some production information first. The 22nd of January 1988 was the original air date and it was directed by Dick Martin, who we've met before. Written by Chris Ruppenthal, who we've also met before. Lisa Robin has played Tina. She has been in The Rum Diary, James Dean, Roseanne, Like Father Like Son, and she was a student driver in Hammer Gets Nailed, if you remember That's that. That's the TV crew in the back seat and they get out the car and the guy get his arms broken. Well remembered. John Paragon played Monroe. He was born in 1954. An actor-writer known for Elvira, The Pee Wee Herman Show, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Seinfeld, and UHV, a good Weird Yell Ankovic movie. And he was, impressively, a founder member of the Groundlings Improv Group. Okay. Anthony De Longhi played Swenson, born in 1950. An actor, director, and stunt director. To just like stunt double for folk with hairy arms. Robin Williams <laughs> was his. Uh, yeah. That was him in Good Morning Vietnam, working the decks. He has starred in The Millers, Gangster Squad, Star Trek Voyager, Batman Returns, Santa Barbara, Roadhouse, MacGyver, Murder She Wrote, The A Team, and Quincy. An expert fencer and bullwhip handler. He's a member of the International Knife Throwers Hall of Fame. A fifth degree black belt. He reminds me of William Smith. I was going to say that's exactly who. Yeah. Yeah. yeah if you I'm don't well. know who William Smith is, look him up. Yeah. Two men with varied and interesting careers. Glenn Chin played Nakamishi. That's no way that's his real name. We're talking stereotypes. Yeah. Born in 1948. Starred in Fifty First Dates, Natural Born Killers, Knock Off, Ninja Turtles 3, Michael Jackson's Black or White video, and Hard Ticket to Hawaii. The title, you've got a little bit of trivia on where that originated from. 
there was obviously a movie supposed to give a war and nobody came, which I think it developed from a newspaper article. It was a headline and a, a piece from, is it Vietnam War? 66. Yeah, that early. Yeah, it would, it would yeah. be Korean, it would be Vietnam, Vietnam yeah. I think, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, maybe we can link that up in the show notes eventually. I'm only about 12 okay. episodes behind in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> the movie was, uh, that you referenced, from 1970. And it's got quite a Columbo connection. All right, okay. Suzanne Plachet, Bradford Dillman, Don Amishi were all in it. Do you recognise those names? Yes. And it was directed by Hi Averback who was at the helm for two classics, suitable for framing and a stitching crime. There you go. We don't, I don't think we mentioned during the episode, but he references Leroy Neiman. Does he? Yes. When he changed the advert himself, he says something along the lines of, Leroy Neiman, eat your heart out. Right. Neiman was an expressionist sports artist, and he also created the uh, Femlins for the Playboy jokes page. I think this was a caricature, a character that was... Widely known in the Playboy magazine. Ah, okay. Not one I've ever read. No. You just looked at the pictures. <laughs> Listen, there's words in that magazine. Um, I love the smell of paintball in the morning was obviously... Napalm. Yes. Uh, reference to Apocalypse Now. Favourite line? Yeah, I said before, it said because I'm dead. Okay. Mine's would be the why play war when you can join the police force and kill for fun and profit. But a special mention to put some pants on. Okay. Next week, the secret of my excess. Okay. And that's us. Great. Put some pants on. Zip. <laughs> bye bye. Cheerio.